Tour Guides. I'm Carrie. I'm Catherine. And I'm Bree. Today we are taking you on a tour of Portland. I've never been, um, never really made it past California moving north. So, uh. Well, I've never been to Portland either, but Bree and I will be in the Pacific Northwest mm-hmm. a week from right now yeah. from We're recording, recording this. this. Not when it releases. Yeah, a week from recording this. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Excited for that. I've never been either, but yep, yeah, that's all I got to comment on it is that's happening. Yeah. So. Well, luckily, we don't have to go to Portland in order to enjoy Portland <coughs> wines. Bless you. Oh, thank you. That hurt. <sighs> so we are delving back into the world of wine this week. Love it. We are covering Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir, which are the two most important grapes in Oregon. Chardonnay comes in at number three. Both of the wines that we are having today are from the Willamette Valley in Oregon, which encompasses Portland, and they were both $16. So I'm going to flip-flop how I usually do it. I usually try to cover the white first because that's what we're drinking first, but I'm going to start with the Pinot Noir. And so Pinot Noir is a light-bodied red that is low in tannins and typically gives flavors of cherry, raspberry, clove, earthy herbs, or mushrooms. Uh, Oregon Pinots are a bit more nuanced, and they're known to have more cranberry Yum. And earthiness to it. So the Pinot Noir grape originated in Burgundy, France around the year 808 and is still most commonly grown there. And it works really well because the Pinot Noir grape is a really delicate one that likes long, cool growing seasons, which is perfect for Burgundy and Oregon. A little fun fact from Wine Folly. Shout out. I use them a lot for my research. Pinot Noir is one of the few red grapes that is commonly made into red, rosé, white, and sparkling wine. Ooh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So a little bit about... I love sparkling red wines. Right? I love them. Mm-hmm. But I like... I've... I just love sparkling wines. That too. I've only ever had one dry red sparkling. Oh man. So good. Um, so about our wine today... Well, Oregon wines in general. The Pinot Noir can be a little tricky, and Zach will go off about this. Um, Pinot Noir is definitely a wine that you get what you pay for. There is a steep quality and difference between a $10 bottle and a $30 bottle. And as you said, or as I said earlier, these were 16, so I'm going to have to let it open up here in a second. So we're going to crack it open because it's a little crack top, not a pop top. But that way it'll open up, give it some more flavor. And just be a little bit easier to drink. Now that's going to be hard to drink if you don't, but definitely one to let open up your dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes wines that are labeled a grape varietal aren't necessarily 100% that grape across the board. In Oregon, however, their Pinot Noir has to contain at least 90% uh, Pinot Noir grapes, which is a lot stricter than in other parts of the U.S., So usually just has to be the majority of that grape, and they will tend to be a little higher, like 70%, and having some mix uh, just to help round out some of the flavors, or, you know, if there was a better crop of one of the blending grapes, I might add in a little bit more just to help give it a nice balance, you know, whatever reason that they might have to add in other grapes. But for Oregon Pinot Noirs, it has to be at least 90% the Pinot Noir grape. So from wine enthusiasts about the Pinot Noir that we are drinking today, which is the Vintner's Reserve from Samuel Robert Winery, quote, this has seriously good varietal flavors of blackberries, savory herbs, cola, and a touch of bitter thistle, and even some earthy minerality. What's not to like? Complexity and authenticity along with Wilmette Valley credentials. Boom. So we are going to go ahead and crack this bad boy open so we can start breathing. Ready, and there he goes. Good crack. All right. On to our Pinot Gris. Um, So the reason that I saved the Pinot Gris for a second is because the Pinot Gris grape is a mutation from the Pinot Noir grape. Uh, This grape is commonly used for white wines, but it can also be used for rosés. For the whites, you can expect flavors of lemon, white peach, melon, raw almond, Mm. and sometimes slate or gravel. So the Pinot Gris grape is a pink grape. Cute. Yeah. It's a cute little guy. (laughs) Uh, We're actually drinking from the King Estate selection today. 
Uh, King Estate is probably one of the larger vineyards out there. Uh, from Wine Enthusiast, a quote about it. This baseline Pinot Gris really shines in this vintage. It's bursting with freshly cut pear that feels fleshy and textured. Juicy highlights of citrus boost the mouthfeel and add further liveliness to the finish, which ultimately resolves a papaya tone. Mm. Yes, so that's our Pinot Gris. I'm gonna crack this bad boy open. That was a good nice. crack. That was a clean <laughs> crack. And then we have some nice wine ASMR going for us. Yay. <laughs> Oh, she's pouring. There she go. There she goes. Are you done with your notes, Carrie? That is all she wrote. Lovely. By she, I mean me. So for, for me... Oh, damn, this smells good. It does. It smells really nice. I um, am basing... So first of all, we had the major power outages and water shortages. We talked about this a little bit. We are still behind on getting some groceries and supplies um so i was gonna make several different things and we just could not seem to get them so i was gonna make a marion berry pie which marion berries are similar to a blackberry but they're very very regional to oregon and they sound delicious and i was gonna make a pie and ice good. cream because dairy is also really important in oregon um couldn't find marion berries um, then I was Naturally. gonna make homemade ice cream with blackberries. Couldn't find heavy whipping cream because every literally everywhere is gone. Out. And then I was doing more research, trying to find something else. And um, I read an Eater.com article that says brunch in Portland is like a blood sport, <laughs> and that really resonated with me. Um, I love we are brunch people. I love it. And so I was going to make avocado toast and I bought six avocados from two different locations and none of them are ripe enough. Even still, I bought it several, day, several days ago. Even still, they are not ripe enough to make avocado toast for our brunch. And of course, I had avocados that were ripe, but I didn't get the texts until <laughs> I was out of my neighborhood. And so, but you know what we had last week? Avocado toast. Yes, we did. We ate it at, at brunch for our Valentine's Day. But I love avocado toast. So, so I finally was able to find eggs. So instead we made egg sandwiches mm -hmm. and home fried potatoes. And Delicious. then vanilla ice cream that I did not make homemade because I could not find whipping cream with a blackberry sauce that I did make homemade. Yay. So um, it was, yeah, we had just a little brunch and I still got some dairy and I got some berries in there. And it wasn't exactly right, but it was delicious. And, it was um, delicious. That, that is our, our Portland meal. I, I wish I could have done more, but, you know, circumstances. Yeah, you know, pandemic, snowstorm. Yeah. just People being crazy. Just, uh, just doing the best we can. Oh, yeah. Once referred to as the Clearing, Portland won its name in a coin toss. In 1843, business partners Asa Lovejoy and William Overton claimed the land on the west bank of the Willamette River that we would come to know as Portland after Overton sold his shares of the claim to the land to Francis Pettigrove, and Lovejoy and Pettigrove flipped a coin for naming rights. Pettigrove won and named the area after his hometown in Maine. However, some of you may know Portland better as Stumptown, so named because it was a town full of stumps. Tree stumps, that is. In the mid-1800s, Portland grew so rapidly that they had to clear the land of trees to make room for all the pesky humans, but, as it turns out, while the trees may be relatively easy to cut down, the stumps, the stumps were a bit more stubborn, so they kind of just left a lot of them. Like, people would use the stumps to avoid the muddy roads prior to there being any paved roads or sidewalks in the area, and they just, like, jump from stump to stump. Anyway, stump down. Ta-da! I'm including this next bit purely for the quote. In 1846, the former high sheriff, William Johnson, was charged with being moved and reduced by an evil heart, did sell, barter, give, or trade ardent spirits, and was invo invited for, indicted for his crimes. In 1851, we've got Doofenshmirtz Incorporated. Just kidding. But the city of Portland was incorporated in this year on February 8th, and the first municipal building was also created that year. And guess what that was? A jail. 
Anyway, in 1860, steamboats brought gold into Portland from Idaho, establishing Portland as Freight Depot of the Columbia. And in 1868, the first railroad through the Oregon Central Railroad Company broke ground in East Portland. In 1873, school integration began after the quote-unquote colored school closed. And that same year, there was also a major fire that started at the furniture factory of Hergren and Schindler, and it decimated almost a third of the business area of the city and 20 blocks, causing over $1 million worth of damage. <clears throat> no one taking their lessons from London here? Okay. Um, in 1874, Chief James Lepius arrested 15 members of the Women's Temperance and Prayer League for picketing the saloons downtown. The women were charged with and found guilty of disorderly praying and sentenced to one day in jail. Okay. Anyway, in 1883, the Northern Pacific Transcontinental Railroad entered Portland. In 1886, members of the Anti-Cooley League blew up two Chinese laundries and burned the shacks of market gardeners before telling the Chinese population that they had 30 days to get the hell out of Portland. Okay, and fuck you. Much of the Chinese populace returned to China or moved to San Francisco. Mayor John Gates activated city militias and doubled the police force to intervene against these threats against the Chinese population. There's a local legend revolving around the Shanghai tunnels under Portland's modern-day Chinatown and downtown areas that date back to when Portland was a cargo stop on the Columbian Willamette Rivers, and the legend says... The name uh, came from the practice of kidnapping residents for service on a ship, and this was called shanghai Now, while the tunnels do exist, there's still debate as to whether what you'd like to see for yourself. They do offer a guided tour, and there's a bar close by called the Shanghai Tunnel Bar. In 1888, Portland was dubbed the City of Roses by attendees of an Episcopal Church convention. In 1891, the Port of Portland was created, and in 1896, Union Station was opened. In 1894, George Harden became the first African-American police officer, and he served until 1915 when he became the first African-American to be hired by the sheriff's office. In 1906, the first official Chinese consul was appointed in Portland in recognition of Portland's large Chinese population and trade importance. Boy Bakken was appointed the consul for Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, and he was the fourth consul to be appointed in the U.S., in 1907, Portland had its first Rose Festival, and in 1908, an ordinance approved the hiring of the first policewoman. Lola Green Baldwin was hired as the superintendent of the Women's Auxiliary to the Police Department for the Protection of Girls, making her the first municipally paid policewoman in the U.S. Get it! Yeah! In 1912, Simon Benson, a local businessman, donated $10,000 to the city so they could install drinking fountains in downtown Portland, and y'all have to look these up. They're apparently some of Portland's rarest and most historic attractions, but they're called Benson Bubblers, which automatically makes me giggle, and they kind of remind me of short and squat Lumieres, like the... It's from Beauty and the Beast. That's a Beauty and the Beast reference for those of you who weren't obsessed with that movie as a child like me. And yes, I know it was a book first. Multiple retellings, actually. Check out the OG version, because hoo-hoo, yowza. Anyway, look them up. Apparently, they're a whole thing, and I think they were installed as a way to reduce alcohol consum consumption, especially when workers would get off of work or be on lunch to encourage them to drink from the easily accessible fountains rather than going to the bars. Anyway, now we're going to skip ahead a few decades here because most of what I found during that time, aside from a bit about the Spanish flu, which was hitting all over the place um, and which we've previously talked about, was on all of these bridges opening up in Portland and like zoning stuff. So, yeah. In 1942, the council adopted Resolution 22113, which urged the federal government to evacuate Japanese citizens from the area. Again, in... 1942. I'm just going to leave that there for y'all to think on what that means. The next year, World War II turned Portland into a major shipbuilding center and 67,000 more people moved into Portland. Nice fun fact to squeeze in and lighten things up a bit before bringing it back down because it is me after all. Portland is also home to the world's smallest city park and it's known as Mills and Park. It's, I think it said a 24-inch circle with, like, some foliage in the middle. 
It used to be the location of a lamppost. So when they took the lamppost out, it was just a gaping hole. Okay, so maybe that's a little bit dramatic. But I mean, honestly, at this point, what do you expect from me? So anyway, in 1946, a local journalist for the Oregon Journal started writing about this random patch of forgotten dirt in his column saying that it was, quote, the only group of leprechauns to establish a colony west of Ireland, end quote, which inevitably drew attention to the spot, leading to it officially getting park status somewhere between 1971 and 1976, and in so doing, setting the record as the world's smallest city park. So, yay, fun! And now back to the downer. We've talked about this a bit before, I think in our LA episode maybe, um, but Portland also experienced what was called redlining, in which the federal post-war housing mortgage insurance program issued maps, uh, used red ink to indicate, quote, bad risk areas in which they targeted minority areas in 1947. And in 48, the first female mayor, Dorothy McCullough Lee, was elected. In 1952, the Portland Realty Board changed their tune in their code of ethics, saying it was, quote, no longer the board's official position that the presence of African Americans depresses property values, end quote. That same year, the school district hired their first African American high school teacher, Robert G. Ford, a man after my own heart. He taught English and social studies at Roosevelt High, my two areas of study. In 1964, the forestry building burned, which isn't funny, obviously, but, like, seriously? The forestry building? Come on, y'all. Okay. In 1970, the City Hall Liberty Bell was bombed. And in 1980, the city of Portland and Multnomah County passed the 1% for Art slash Public Art Ordinance, which I believe we talked about something similar when we did our Denver episode. You know how we love the arts and community support of the arts. In 1980, at 8.32 a.m., Mount St. Helens erupted. And while ha- there had been smaller steam eruptions prior to this, this eruption was bigger and left 57 people dead. In 2000, the classical Chinese garden opened and Money Magazine declared Portland the number one city to live in. Fun fact, uh, Portland had the most strip clubs as of this article published in August of last year per capita in the U.S., and strip clubs are historic landmarks in Portland, and they apparently bring in the foodies from all over the place. Mm, I'm down. Let's go. Uh, Portland hosts the world's largest naked bike ride, which started in 2004 as a protest against society's dependence on oil. Guys, thousands of people come to participate in this bike ride through Portland, and it's like some super secret route and everything. Amazing. So, Portland is also home to the Unipiper, Brian Kidd, who's a street-performing unicyclist and musician. Kidd rides a unicycle dressed as Darth Vader, characters from Game of Thrones, and Pokemon whilst playing flaming bagpipes. My idol. (laughs) Portland has the largest independently owned new and used bookstore in the world, Powell's City of Books, which takes up an entire city block and has over one million books. Okay, I'm now a cartoon character with hard eyes and my heart showing as an outline as it tries to... Guys, the rooms are color-coded. Bless. And they have more than 3,500 different sections with a wide variety of topics. Sounds like heaven to me. And for my fellow book lovers out there, I'll drop the link in the blog of A Complete Book Lover's Guide to Portland, compiled by not me. You're welcome. And then there's also this wonderful place I say as though I've ever actually been there but screw it it sounds wonderful called voodoo donuts see donuts automatically wonderful anyway in addition to their delicious fare they also perform legal wedding ceremonies ranging from a smaller nine guest gathering to the quote whole shebang the latter including a personal tour of Portland with the owners of voodoo themselves sign me up all right And for our lore, we have Colossal Claude. So, tales of Colossal Claude have been going around since 1934, when a group of sailors saw a 40-foot snake-like creature with an, quote, evil look in its eye near the mouth of the Columbia River. So, Claude was seen multiple times over the following 20 years, by travelers and sailors as far down as Lincoln City. And regardless of 
what Colossal Claude actually is. Um, you know, keep an eye out when it comes to the water surrounding Oregon, because uh, Claude might give Nessie a run for her money. So there's also this Port Portland pizza place. Um, it's called Old Town Pizza, and it's one. It's supposed to be one of the best pizza spots in town, but it's also been haunted by a woman's ghost. Her name was Nina for more than a hundred years. Um, based on the legends, she was a local sex worker who helped the authorities bring down the baddies. And due to her involvement, she was pushed down an elevator shaft of a the building Old Town Pizza now stands in today. So people fucking suck. She was trying to help. And as always, beware the shaft. Now her name is apparently carved into one of the bricks in that elevator shaft. But she's not a vengeful spirit, and she kind of just hangs around the pizza parlor and, you know, sometimes spooks out <laughs> customers, employees alike. Now, this next one is a legend, legend. Like, it's not that old, but there's so much controversy around it. So it's the Plebeus Game Cabinet. In 1981, an arcade in Portland allegedly had a gaming cabinet known as Polybius. Countless gamers who played the game started coming down with migraines, having heart attacks, seizures, suffering from addiction, and amnesia, and it was all said to have been caused by the game itself. A couple of teenagers were even said to have gone missing after playing the game. The game was said to have been created to test mind control technology on civilians, unbeknownst to them, obviously, by some unknown government agency the night after they started playing. Before we get into the whole conspiracy, let's have a little backstory. So, the name Polybius was probably specifically chosen because of its origins with the ancient Greece philosopher from Megalopolis, I can never say that right, sorry about it, Arcadia, around 208 BC, who was named the same, a name which, by the way, means many lives in Greek. Polybius was notoriously a whiz at puzzles and cryptography, and he believed that historians should only report what they can back up by interviewing witnesses and with cold hard ev evidence. So, obviously, with a name with a backstory such as that, this game was bound to be spooktacular from the start. So, Polybius's notoriety gained further traction in early 2000 when coinop.org posted about it, and here's a little quote from the game detail section of the post. Quote, according to an operator who ran an arcade with one of these games, guys in black coats would come to collect records from the machines. They're not interested in quarters or anything. They just collected information about how the game was played. End quote. The listing also claims the game was copyrighted in 1981, but according to this article, no copyright exists. Another fun little quote from that post to give you guys some insight into how serious some people were about this game and the stories surrounding it were, if the original listing was anything more than a ploy to get more site visits and clicks, that is, quote, quick update. We just wanted to go on record here that Stephen Roach is full of himself and knows nothing about this game. We have it on good authority. No, Polybius is not a Tempest prototype. No, Polybius is not a vector game. Does the title screen look vector? No, it does not. We've recently some new, received some new information about the game. Today's May 16th, 2009. And yes, one of us is flying to Kiev, Ukraine area tomorrow. And yes, the trip is related to this information. Stay tuned. End quote. Polybius has obviously made its mark in history as evidenced by the fact that it has been the subject of numerous documentaries, TV shows, music videos, an episode of The Simpsons, not to mention the extensive investigations into the game and the claims surrounding it. There were even multiple different movies about arcade games that had powers, and there's apparently a podcast about the Polybius legend. But Polybius didn't actually use mind control on civilians in some government conspiracy-level experiments, right? The answer may not be as clear as you'd like, so let's look at the game itself first. The game cabinet was said to be a black box with no name, and the game was supposed to addict people with its colorful shapes and geometric patterns. The game's title screen allegedly, and I say allegedly because the article I read said there was only a screenshot of it, and the picture of the cabinet itself was more some blurry photo that may or may not have been early attempts at Photoshop, but it allegedly credited... Uh, let's see, Sinislorschen, as the company that developed the game. Sorry, it's German, sort of, and I'm bad at umlauts, okay? 
uh, which roughly, and I stress roughly, translate in German to something like sensory deprivation or sense deleting. Some sources, I'm not sure how reputable, said Polybius played similarly to the vector styles of games like Tempest, a game that was also thought to have caused people to become sick after playing. One kid got an intense migraine, and when I say intense, I mean he ended up throwing up, was unable to speak or walk for a time during the episode, and allegedly collapsed on the ground, quote, rolling and screaming in pain, until someone called the cops. He said it felt like his head was cracking open, and that was the first migraine he ever had. The man said he's had them on and off throughout his life since then. Another man suffered a heart attack and died after making the high score list on another game, Berserk. One man even apparently claimed that he'd been abducted and taken into Portland's underground tunnels, which we'll talk a bit more about later, and I referenced earlier, and he was found the following day in the middle of Tillamook Stake Forest, which was 60 miles from his house. There were a number of other similar stories, and many were attributed to the arcade games, so it's not hard to see how people could jump to the conclusion that it was all caused by the games, and from there, well... You can imagine how people may have stated, started fearing how the arcade games may affect them long term. While the way the games seemed able to hypnotize their children for hours on end made parents nervous, because remember, this was, you know, not always the norm. While it is now, it wasn't always. This was more of a new fad. So the paranoid stories of actual mind control through these games were more believable due to the fact that Big Brother was, in fact, conducting secret operations out of arcades at that time. FBI records indicate that they were actually monitoring and raiding arcades in and around Portland around the same time that all of these stories reading like, quote, heart attack linked arcade game, end quote, started coming out in the news. The FBI was running operations out of arcades because at that time, Arcades had a lot of pickpockets, gambling, and drug activity, and some operations included setting some of the cabinets up with mics and cameras to try to catch the criminals in the act. The article I read made a good point. There were a lot of teens in these arcade parlors, and they kept seeing men in black bringing these game machines in and out of the arcades every few days. Would it be that hard to believe that the government is up to some kind of fuckery? especially considering the rumors at the time of the CIA program referred to as MK Ultra, where they were looking for mind control techniques through multimedia, technology, and lots of drugs. And this was all done without the subject's permission. The subjects these techni- techniques were tested on described it as extreme psychological torture. So, yeah, not that hard to believe that the government would have tried to control the minds of the masses through arcade games. However, while these stories lend credence to claims that Polybius was used by the government for mind control, none of them involved the game itself, and no one seems able to get their hands on the real thing, if ever there was one, to play now, so who knows? Maybe Polybius was just a story that's been passed down over the years. Or maybe, just maybe, that's just what Big Brother wants us to believe. (laughs) Sorry, couldn't help myself. Okay, so next we have Multnomah Falls. So, one of the most photographed places in of a Native American woman's sacrifice. Um, so, Portland Monthly, I guess, said she jumped to her death in order to spare her tribe from an illness that was coming their way. And some people say they can still see her apparition in the water, um, while others say she comes back every winter to revisit the site of her death. So, that's super sad. And then next we have the Roslyn Theater. Um, so one of the theater's former promoters went missing in the late 80s, and they believed his body was dumped in the Willamette River, tied down by microphone stands. So I guess the ghost of Tim Moreau still haunts the venue, um, and he's angry at the theater's former owner, who apparently ran a counterfeiting scam. An altercation between Moreau and Larry Hurwitz led to, allegedly led to Moreau's untimely demise. I believe he was 21 years old and a publicist. Um, But that was when it was still called Starry Nights before it became Rosalind. And Hurtwitz served a 12-year sentence for Moreau's murder. Okay, so I mentioned earlier the Shanghai Tunnels. Um, It's supposed to be one of the most haunted places in America. 
It's located underneath the streets of Portland, and the tunnels were used between 1850 and 1941 uh, for illegal activity, allegedly, including human trafficking, where sailors, um, blue-collar workers, and loggers were taken under town, Old Town and sold off to sea captains who were looking for crews. And a lot of people died in the dark, dingy tunnels, and of course, it left their ghosts behind. So, Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel actually fe- featured these tunnels in an episode. They've also been used in episodes of Leverage and Grimm. And the local historian Michael P. Jones um, actually does guided tours underneath Old Town. And even though a lot of historians say that visitors were almost definitely abducted and shipped from Portland, some say the tunnels likely weren't used for that purpose. But... I don't know. Lots of people say they hear phantom voices moaning and talking and screaming down there. So, who's to say? And then my last one is McMenamin's, I think that's right, White Eagle Saloon. White Eagle Saloon. So, apparently, one of the housekeeping crew said that something grabbed her ankle when she was cleaning one time and, quote, would not let go until she jumped away. The management claims it can neither confirm nor deny these reports, but the restaurant chain has included that story on its official blog. And that is the end of lore. For our haunting this week, um, so first off, there are so many haunted us places here. We're going to have to revisit Portland at some point. And then maybe we can actually get our avocado toast. <laughs> maybe. I love avocado toast. I know. Um, but I narrowed it down to four and became so invested in this one that I stuck with it because I, I loved it. It was fun. So this is the Haunted Benson Hotel. Mm. So Simon Benson... The namesake of our hotel was born in Norway on September 9th, 1851, to a large family. His family began their migration to America in 1861, when his eldest brother came over, and then his sister followed in 1865. In 1867, the family decided that they didn't want to be separated by an ocean and moved to Wisconsin. Okay. That makes sense, though. Wisconsin has a ton of Scandinavian immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. It's cold there. It's cold Norway. Makes sense. Yeah. So while there, Simon began working. He was a farmhand and eventually a logger. After a few years in Wisconsin, Simon opened a general store and got married. Clearly on the up and up here. Just after three years of his prosperous store being opened, it burned because this is the the 1800s. It will burn. This left him penniless. Penniless? Penniless? Both are correct, I think. Yep. Poor. Broke. He was, he was po. He was po. So Simon and his family made their way to Portland in 1880, where he began work in the timber industry, since that's where he had his experience in Wisconsin, and began to climb the ladder within the industry. Unfortunately, his wife, Esther, died of tuberculosis in 1891. Oh no, consumption. Consumption. Leaving Simon with their three children to care for. Since this was the late 1800s, Simon had to remarry in order to have his children cared for. And so he did three years later in 1894. He lasted a long time. I know. He used his experience in the logging industry to create his own company, Benson Logging and Lumber Company. He was very successful. Obviously, he ended up having a hotel named after him. So, good venture here. Mm. Um... But he did some innovative things, like introduced the donkey steam engine that would make their hauling of timber easier and more efficient. Interesting. He also invented the log raft called the Benson Raft that could transport six million board feet of logs through the ocean. He's got a lot of stuff named after him. Yeah. Oh, it just keeps coming up. Uh, Needless to say, he did very well for himself with these inventions and innovations, but he was not a selfish man. He did use his acquired wealth to better his city. So he initially put forth $10,000 or over $300,000 today worth of contributions that were put toward 20 bronze drinking fountains called Benson Bubblers. That's cute. Uh, Yeah. More stuff named after him. Yep. 
in addition to road work and public parks. Okay. So the water fountains were kind of a big deal for him because it was his way of pointing out to the public that he really disapproved of alcohol. Interesting. Like, he... I mean, this was his public stamp saying, this is a free alternative to alcohol. Sorry, Simon. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, Simon, especially later uh, when I start talking about the hotel. So the hotel is located at 309 Southwest Broadway Street, and it opened on March 5th, 1913, after an 18-year, not 18, reading is hard, eight-year construction period. It opened 11 years before my guy was born. Wow. Maybe he stayed here. Maybe. The hotel is designed in an elaborate French Empire style, similar to the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, if you need that frame of reference. It has 287 rooms across 12 stories. Initially, the hotel opened as the New Oregon Hotel, an annexation of the original Oregon Hotel. So far, uh, not so far. So for the grand opening, they had doorknobs engraved with OH. Cute. Oregon Hotel. Uh Uh-huh. It is the essence or of opulence. O. O. <laughs> Hi, O. No, not Ohio, Oregon. Um, but it is extra. On the exterior, the hotel boasts beautifully glazed terracotta and br- brick with arched lobby windows and a French mansard roof with dormers. So that's that like steep pitch mm-hmm. and it has a little details up at the top. Uh, and then inside, it was graced with a 50-foot glass and steel marquee proclaiming the hotel's name, leading in to it. Yeah. Um, Italian marble floors and staircase lined with cast iron railing, Austrian crystal chandeliers, and a Caesarian walnut wood from the imperial forests of Russia. Wow. So going back to that marble stairwell, uh, this is kind of a side note. I didn't know where else to put it in my notes, so it's going right here. Sure. Uh, The stairwell is still there, has the original marble, and features over 160 photos that tell the history of the Benson Hotel and Portland's famous historic landmarks, Uh, and the photos date back to 1847. That's cute. Yeah. I mean, it's still... Someone's been taking care of it, obviously. Marble's so porous, it's... Mm Mm-hmm. So, like, it's been a while taken care of. That's nice. Oh, yeah. We'll touch on that. (laughs) Oh, has it been taken care of? Mm -hmm. So, going back to 1913, the Benson Hotel had all the latest and greatest private bathrooms, automatic (laughs) door switches, (laughs) circulating ice water, and even electric lights in the closets. Ooh. Ooh. (laughs) So dapper. So fancy. But really, though, that's nice. For this time, that's like... For 1913. Advanced. Oh, yeah. But he wanted the best of the best. And he got it, damn it. And he got it. Good for you, Benson. Uh, Yeah, so they also provided, quote, a complimentary cup of hot clam nectar. What the hell is hot clam nectar? So I was at work when I was typing these notes, and I was a little scared to research it because it was either going to be something, one, nasty, two... Something could have popped up that was sexual. Or, yeah. Or three. Yuck. Like deceiving and could actually be something very nice. But they provided that every morning for their guests. And. Did the guests want it? I guess so. But luckily in modern times, that's now complimentary coffee and oh. not hot clam nectar. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Ew. <laughs> I hate that. I could make a comment, but I'm not going to. No, don't. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Please don't throw up. Um, so the total cost to furnish this hotel was about $1 million. Ooh, so, back in the day. So nowadays, that would be about $26.5 million. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So about a year and a half after, th- after it opened, mismanagement of the property kept losing it money now benson was just building it he did not he wasn't in charge of operations right and so when it started losing money he was like okay i'm stepping in and took it over hence the benson hotel name something more after me yes benson's a name and so 
it went back and forth of when it actually was named the Benson Hotel, but I think it makes sense for him to name it after himself when he took it over. Yeah, if the doorknob said the Oregon Hotel, that makes sense. Right. Um, so he quickly turned things around, and it has been thriving ever since. In 1919, six years after it opened, Benson sold the hotel to William Boyd and Robert Keller, who owned it until 1944, so they had it a, a long time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and it was successful. And it changed hands several times and ended up having extensive renovations beginning in 1955 when they spent $250,000 yep, $250, to turn the Oak Room into the London Grill that had three private dining rooms. That makes sense. Yeah. And then they opened that up to guests and visitors alike, thus bringing in more revenue. Yeah, that makes sense. And, like, that timeline mm -hmm. matches up to what I would think would need to happen for right. it to stay in business. Mm -hmm. And then in 1959, they added another restaurant, 175 more guest rooms, and the Mayfair Ballroom that could hold 400 people. Uh, and that was from that annexed Oregon Hotel. So I don't okay. know. I, th I guess they must have, like, bought it out. It, it wasn't really clear. Maybe they were, like next door buildings that's what i was and thinking. they just expanded and officially merged the two right that's that was my take on it yeah but it was really ambiguous um so then in 1980 they spent three million more dollars to redecorate and refurbish the rooms and suites to make them luxury quality in addition to opening up the piccadilly bar mm -hmm. to create a cocktail lounge that would be space for live entertainment Perfect. Good things in a hotel. Oh, yeah. There were several dates for this, but the Western International Hotel Company bought the Benson. Most sources said in 1981. But just after they bought it, they spent another $3 million in renovations. So there's just money being poured into this, but obviously it's still prosperous enough for it. That to, it needs it. Yeah. Yeah. So then in 1986, the Benson was registered on the National Registrar of Historic Places. Cool. And went through yet another multi-million dollar renovation. Well, they're probably like just keeping up with technology. Oh, yeah. You have to be doing this many renovations. Like security systems alone. Oh, yeah. Plumbing. Mm-hmm. LED light bulbs. Like doing a building that size. If you switch everything to LED, which is like a standard now pretty much. Oh, yeah. That cost, what, $100,000 minimum? Oh, yeah. I don't know how much, but I'm assuming at least that much, right? Well, like, we, when we bought our house, we switched everything over to LED, and it cost us, like, oh, goodness, probably $150 to get everything switched over. Mm hmm Granted, we did a lot of, like, little cosmetic work, getting things updated. I got little LED lights for underneath my plugs. It's the best. Um, a few years later, in 1988, the Western International Incorporation sold the Benson Hotel, and it went through another restoration and renovation. So either people were mixing up these dates, or this hotel has had more work done than the Kardashians. <laughs> uh, rough. Because yeah. then... Huh? I said, yeah, but like... Were they upkeeping the natural look or were they completely redoing it? Because they I were feel completely like... redoing it. They were just updating. So it's probably old enough that like just taking care of like the floors and the HVAC oh, yeah. and you know what I mean? Like I'm Yeah. I'm wondering if it's not all cosmetic, if it's like structural in a lot of this. I'm sure for some of it it was. Yeah. But there was that was just one thing that struck me about this was there were so many renovations. Uh, um, oh, yes. So then in 1990, there was a $17 million renovation uh, that was completed in 1991, where they had a grand celebration and invited the relatives of the designers to see the new updated hotel. That's nice. It was very nice. So nowadays, there are two huge ballrooms that are used for conferences, weddings, and parties. There's the uh, restaurant. That should be a beautiful wedding. Right? Well, and I was just perusing through pictures, and it's beautiful. I would have liked to have gotten married there. I like my wedding, though. It was nice. Um, uh, restaurant and lounge areas. There we go. And exercise facilities. According to one site, you can have Starbucks delivered to your room. So your $5 coffee can be a $15 coffee. Mm. Ooh. 
So before we jump into our ghosties, ghost, uh, we do have one famous death here. In fact, it was the only death that was really talked about in the hotel. On November 12th, 2008, the former drummer for Jimi Hendrix, Mitch Mitchell, died in his room at the Benson, reportedly of natural causes. Some think he might be haunting the hotel, but none of the, the spirits appear to be him. All the ghosts are pretty chill, though. So Nice. Yeah. But uh, as we discussed earlier in previous hotel episodes, some people are just really passionate about their jobs. There is one spirit of a night porter who is seen in solid form. Oh. Rather than... He's a thick boy. He's a thick boy. Corporeal, uh, one might say. <laughs> A nice opaque ghost. <laughs> but he is uh, seen helping guests with their bags. But Adorable. But when the, the guests try to turn and tip him, he disappears. How cute. Aw. Yeah. And then to take it one step further, he was once seen helping a disabled guest into bed. And then startled the guest when he disappeared because his job was done. He said, here you go. Bye. <laughs> right. Poof. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here you go. to get nice and tucked in. Okay, I'm out. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good night, sir and or ma'am, or neither or both, and bye. And he just floats away. <laughs> just like ascends. <laughs> or descend just through the floor. <laughs> just drops off. Duty back. calls. I gotta go. <laughs> gotta go get another bag. Um, yeah, so nice little fella. Helpful. It's and very then, sweet. Could I get through an episode without a La Dame Blanche? Of course. Yes. So there is a woman in a white gown holding a purse who has been seen walking down various hallways of the hotel, but she appears to always be in a hurry. Me too. The same. And then, uh, in addition to our Le Dame Blanche, we have a Le Dame Bleu. There is an apparition of a woman in a turquoise dress wearing red rings that has been seen in the reflection in a large gilded mirror that hangs in the lobby. Wow. Red rings and turquoise. Yeah, she's extra. Good for her. Look, and you see her in a mirror. What a queen. Uh Oh, yeah. She's like... I know I look good. Here, Mm -hmm. look at me in this mirror also. Yeah. You look good, but I also look good. (laughs) Yeah. You see my (laughs) rings. Red rings. Bing, Mm -hmm. bing. All right. On the ninth floor, there is a little three-year-old boy who just wants to play. Oh, no. The little ones who just want to play kill me. Well, see, that... (laughs) Speaking of, that's a weird thing. I don't have death stories for any of these. It's just like, here are the ghosts. Well, I mean, it's been around a long time, and if they added oh. on or did renovations, I'm sure things could have... People have definitely people... died here, but yeah. like... Or maybe they were no even... stories about them. Maybe they were even brought in. Yeah. Like, on lumber from the floor. You know what I mean? Just yeah. from different things. And mirrors... Oh, mirrors are... Mirrors, if they got it, who knows where she came from. Anywhere where the mirror has been before. Oh, yeah. It's like an Uber for the dead. (laughs) 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 Have you called a mirror? Yeah, I just called a mirror. (laughs) (laughs) Can we make that into something? (laughs) Cheers. It's like like an Uber for the dead. (laughs) Uber's on over to a different hotel. And she's like, okay, everyone look at my outfit. I got my red rings on today. Ready for you to look at me. <laughs> oh, I want that on a t-shirt. She's so extra. I yes. <laughs> anyway, so we have this little boy. and There is a slight explanation a little later. Um, but anyway, like I said, I don't really know what his story is. And I also think it would just make me sad to know what his story is. Yes, it's always going to be sad when a three-year-old dies. Yeah. We don't know it's a three-year-old. Some say that it might be Mitch Mitchell, like, reliving his childhood star days, because he was apparently a childhood star over in Europe. Okay. But I don't believe that. I think that would be... It doesn't track. It's kind of a stretch. It it is a stretch. Um, But anyway, he gave fright to a woman as he appeared next to her bedside one evening, and then, thinking it was her own three-year-old child, she reached out to pull him into bed, but her hand went through him, and he, like, kind of jumped at her. Just like playfully, like a little three year old, be like, boo. She was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and so they played peekaboo. She would like pull the sheet up and then drop it down. He would jump at her. And apparently, after, 
minutes. After a couple little bouts of that, he just disappeared, which is when she realized that he was a fucking ghost. And I was like, would you not just be like, who is this child in my room as I'm sleeping? Yeah, that would that would be very concerning to me. Right. But if she had her own child, who knows? Right. But, like, if you're in a hotel room, I would assume that the door would be locked because they now naturally lock. Yeah. Um, or, like, they automatically lock. And then this child is just, like, in your room. She's like, hey. Yeah, that's weird. Um, he's also been seen hiding behind bedside tables and will jump out trying to spook guests. But not, like, malicious. He's just like, I want to play. He's like a child. He's like my kitten, currently. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some guests and staff members will leave out candy and toys, hoping to catch a glimpse of this friendly little spirit. Oh, Yeah. And then, finally, the big daddy himself, Simon Benson. Obviously, this was a place that he cared about, so it makes yeah. sense for him to be, you know, checking in on it. And He's like, why is there a cocktail lounge? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you get there. He doesn't like it. <laughs> God, let them have their fun, Simon. We get there. So... He's often seen wearing a formal dark suit coming down the grand staircase, seeming very pleased and happy. People will also just see his upper half walking through common rooms, like the meeting rooms, restaurants, checking in, keeping tabs on all the little happenings in the lobby, you know, just, you know, managing his hotel still. Mm-hmm. Pulling a Mr. Mosby. Yes. But, uh, he is seeing the bar area where people will feel him scowling at them. <laughs> <laughs> Or they've even experienced their drink getting knocked over or out of their hands by unseen forces. He's like, Ugh. <laughs> No, this drink is too strong! <laughs> you don't get it! <laughs> I'd be like, can I please have a refund or a refill on my beverage? Your ghost just smacked it out of my hand. Oh yeah, well then the bartenders will be like, their bottles behind the bar mm-hmm. will just be like, knocked over. And they're like, seriously? <laughs> like, dude, I'm just trying to do my job. Just let me do my job in your hotel. Technically, you guys hired me, so... Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no he he just really does not like alcohol and that just kind of reiterates that Ooh. and also he has multiple ghostly outfits <laughs> some have seen why are they also <laughs> extra <laughs> that's why i could not My cover goodness. this i love it one of the most extra ghosts i've ever well i guess they're happy right like, so go. i guess that would make sense if they're happy ghosts then they have a little bit more pizzazz we're gonna go we're gonna request to stay on the ninth floor and then go hang out in the cocktail bar and get drunk and hopefully oh, Simon will come please knock our drinks over <laughs> uh but he's also seen wearing a lumberjack outfit i'm assuming Kinda going hot. back to his logging days walking through the dining room um and one woman reports that she saw him walking through as they were preparing for a banquet. He walked through the room into the wine storage area and disappeared. Well, that's rich coming from you, Simon. Yeah, Simon. Into the wine storage area. It's a little area. suspicious, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he has also been spotted on the ninth floor with the little boy. He's like, quit bugging guest, okay? And the little well, boy's like, but I want to play. So, some think that it's one of his sons, but there's no, I didn't see anywhere where any of his sons died at a young age or that they died in the hotel. And so. Maybe he had an illegitimate child who died at three. Maybe. But still, I think it's a stretch. Yeah. Just like Mitch Mitchell being a three-year-old little boy. Yeah. I think it's a stretch. But, you know, he, he found another little ghost and he wants to just care for everybody. What a nice guy. He is in the hospitality business. Mm-hmm. And clearly very successful in the hospitality business. Yeah. Um, so, from what I can tell, there's been no major paranormal investigations done here. Um, but yet. Yet. We're going to do it. But also, none of the guests have been, like, too spooked to leave. So it sounds like okay. a nice little charming hotel where you can just sit in the lap of luxury and experience some nice friendly ghosties. Sounds good. I know. I'm excited. I want to go. Nice. Let's go. Okay. And it seems reasonable too. Oh. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Um. You so in keeping wine, with my South African theme, you know, we did wine mm-hmm. and we did sandwiches and I did a serial killer 
who had a dumb name that we could meme. And I am doing that again. We had wine. Yay. We had sandwiches. And now we got dick. <laughs> Ooh. It's tart, though. It is tart. Thank you. Like that smells very nice. Oh, yes. Mm. It smells really good, and it's a beautiful color. We're sipping the And right I now. know the way that it moves that I'm going to like it. Mm-hmm. If the mouth feels too, like, oily, it kind of freaks me out a little bit, but this yeah. looks really light. So. Oregon Pinot. Oregon Pinot. Oh, yes. Very nice. Mmm. Mmm. Yeah. I get a little bit of cranberry. Not a whole lot. I get more sweetness. Maybe like like a ripe plum. Yeah. I'm thinking of like the plums that my for my grandma's tree. Not like the like fat ones, but like black plums. Yeah, not the black plums, but like the little purple ones. Mm. Yeah, it's good. It's well, tasty. it's also um it's spicy. A little weird, uh, because it looks a little bloody, which our guy drained his victims of blood oh, so it's really fun pacific northwest vampires a lot of times here so um richard lawrence marquette also known as dick but like for real and also in our meme scenario right now yes um what a dick yeah really <laughs> was born december 12th 1934 and he was born in portland oh. and his crimes happened around portland so he's actually from the area He's convicted of killing three women. Mm. He, he would then drain their blood, mutilate, dismember their bodies, and scatter their remains. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Really class act Dick here was. Mm. Um, so he was the first person ever to be added as the 11th name on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Ooh. Um, so the top 10 most wanted list is something that we have here in America that was kind of originally made for public interest generation mm-hmm. almost solely that's it and then they just kept up with it and so he was the first person to be added as 11 um which sometimes they have but so they knew who he was and they wanted to catch him and he was on the list so he murdered Joan Caudle in Portland Aww. um in 1961 and that's when he was added onto the list and he was incarcerated at the Oregon State Penitentiary since 1975, where he died at the age of 86. Mm. Um, so he was convicted of first-degree murder and robbery. His murders were split up over different years. His p- penalty was life in prison. Mm-hmm. So he did get what he needed. Um, there's not a whole lot of personal background information but we do know that he's from Oregon. He grew up in Oregon. He murdered in Oregon. He died in Oregon, all in the Portland area. Clearly so, very well versed in his travel. Yeah. Um, so his name, uh, his first victim's name was Joan, Joan Cottle. And she died in 1961. So police received a phone call from a housewife. And her dog had brought her a human no. foot in a paper bag. Oh, that's messed up. So she's like a 1961 housewife in Oregon who's a good, probably, I'm picturing like golden retriever, ran out and brought her mommy a foot, a oh. human foot in a paper bag. Okay? Gross. Um, so the detectives went to investigate and the dog ran and came back with a hand. Oh! So the dog is like, look at, look at what I found. And the cops are like, oh my God. So, um... They searched, obviously, and they uncovered several more body parts, all fresh and bled dry. So they were completely drained Ooh. of blood, so that, like, stops insect activity and yeah. makes it harder to find. I mean, it's still obviously going to decompose, but it takes a little bit longer. Um, no attempt to bury them. They were literally just scattered along, and yeah. they knew the foot belonged to a woman. This is 1961. Now it yeah. can belong to anyone. And then it could have belonged to anyone, but they knew it belonged to a woman because it had red nail polish on the toes. And her toes were also slightly webbed, so that's like a genetic condition, so they're able to find the victim. Um, so they did an autopsy, but remember, she's in pieces and had no blood. Yeah. And when they did the autopsy, there was no, bl- no blood in her veins or arteries at all, completely Weird. exsanguinated. Um, and it happened shortly after death, and so they knew that there wasn't a buried corpse somewhere. Right. It wasn't like... It was a you know, native burial ground or 
an old war memorial or right. it wasn't a corpse that was been there a long time. It was fresh. recent. It was fresh. Um, so they scanned through missing person um, reports. They first invested a runaway teenager. The aunt said the knee didn't have webbed toes or wear nail polish. Then the next report that they looked into was Joan Caldy, 23-year-old Portland housewife and mother of two. And her Aww. husband had reported her missing. Um, he was obviously the first suspect. Mm-hmm. So investigator questioned him very carefully. He said that she was out shopping for Father's Day gifts when she <gasps> vanished. No. Um, her husband said that she was not a habitual drinker, but she had been depressed as of lately and because her mother was dying. Her mother was really ill. Oh, um, yeah. And so it was plausible that she might have stepped into a bar to get a drink and then she just never came home. Um, the, so they asked if it was possible that, he might, that she might be cheating and he said no, there was no time for her. He's like, he has two small kids, her mom is dying, she wouldn't even have time to cheat on me. Right. Um, and uh, they were like, okay, well does she have webbed toes? And he was like, well, I've never paid that close attention to her feet, and I couldn't say. Which. Okay. If I had webbed toes, everyone would know. Because right. I'd be like, have you seen my freaking weird webbed toes? Right, that's what I'd I'm be so lucky proud head. of them. Yes, I would be like, wow, I'd be proud of them. Anyways. Yeah. Um, so. Thank you, fast swimmer. He didn't know. He added that she couldn't drive a car, or would have used a bus or taxi to travel around. Um, they examined the shoes in her closet and found out that they were the correct size for the foot. Ooh, so they're doing wow. some pretty extensive police work for 1961. Right, and um, for just having a foot. Yes, doing the best that they can. So they found a waitress who, um, and another woman who is at bars a lot, and um, she had a rest for public drunkenness. Oh. And so they went to her and asked her, and they're like, hey, have you seen anyone? Have you been around anyone? And so yeah. she said that she met a man whose name was Marquette. The two were hitting it off well. Another woman approached, took his attention, and the police showed her a photograph of Joan. And she said that was definitely the same lady from the bar. And she said that she was lucky that she wasn't the one who went home with Marquette. So he changed his mark to another person. Wow. And she ended up dead. So he was, like, hunting in yeah. this bar. And he took Joan. Yeah, clearly knew what he was looking looking for. for. Yeah. So the police went to his residence and it was a tiny little shack, no one inside. They find found neatly chopped up human body parts wrapped in newspaper inside the refrigerator. Also bloodstained lingerie and the only significant piece missing was her head. (gasps) Yeah. So they issued an arrest warrant. Manhunt began. Um, the governor got involved, saying he was the most heinous crime in Oregon history. They appealed to the FBI for help. Um, expanded their list to 11 names. Um, he was arrested in California the day after being added to the list. He put up no resistance and seemed almost relieved at his arrest. Um, they did a background check and found that he had two previous arrests for attempted rape. And he also robbed a gas station in Portland and spent a year in jail for that in 57. So clearly needed help. Yeah. So, he claimed that he was in a bar when he saw her, um, and she, he said that she recognized him from elementary school and walked over to him. They had a few drinks, went to a couple more bars, and then came back to his house where they drank more beer and allegedly agreed to have sex. Investigators asked what happened. He claimed that they had sex and got into an argument where he choked her to death. Since he had no oh. vehicle to dispose of her remains, he panicked, dragged the corpse into the shower where he dismembered it. So, the investigators, everything they found out about her, it seemed unbelievable. They're like, um, no, I don't think that's what happened. Yeah. Um, and he was the only living witness, so the prosecution asked for him to be charged with rape as well, since they did not believe that the two had had consensual sex. Uh When asked what became of her head, Marquette led the police to her riverbanks in Portland, where it was fished out of some of the rotting timber on the edge of the water. Oh. Yeah. He was found guilty of first-degree murder, but the jury recommended leniency. Marquette was sentenced to life in prison after an 11-year sentence, which time he was described as a model prisoner, and then he received parole in 1973. Naturally. God. I'm getting tired of saying the same stuff. I know. It, it seems... Oh, he's a model prisoner. He just chopped up a woman. Right. There's There are red flags there. 
You can't let someone who chops up people out of prison. Right. I'm sorry. You or just Or let can't. them out of prison and put them in a mental facility because clearly they need some help. Oh, no. They just let them go. Ugh. So in 75, a fisherman discovered the mutilated human remains um, floating in shallow water in Marion County. Marion Berries. Who uh, knew? Uh-huh. Um, the corpse had been blood drive, savagely mutilated, dismembered, and being dumped with minimal effort of concealment. So they found the major parts, um, except for the genitals, which were missing and never located. Ooh. Yeah. So the detectives determined the remains of those of 37-year-old Betty Wilson. She was from North Carolina, who had, like, a really hard life and 11 children. (gasps) And she got married at the age of 16. Oh, wow. That's (laughs) Yeah. Her and her kids lived in an abandoned school bus at the edge of a city dump with no electricity or water and claimed that her husband was abusive. So... With all of her children in foster care, she stowed away in the trunk of her sister's car to begin a new life far away and had been living with her sister in Salem. She left her kids with the abusive husband? No, they were all in foster care. Oh, oh, oh. No, they were all taken into custody because there was no running water, no electricity. Right. They were literally living in a dump. Yeah. So her kids were all taken care of, so her sister smuggled her away from her husband um, to get as far away as she could. And she got here... Um, Wilson's husband was the initial suspect again, mm-hmm. but he'd been working in North Carolina at the time and couldn't be in Oregon. Yeah. So Marquette thus became the prime suspect because it was the exact same situation. Mm-hmm. Um, only she was older, just like he was older. Yeah. So the detectives began to stake out of his home and obtained a search warrant. They searched both inside and outside of the mobile home where he was living. And they found small pieces of physical evidence that tied him to the murder. So 55 hours after the remains were found, he was once again arrested for murder. There was overwhelming physical evidence and close similarity to Jones' murder. So he pleaded guilty right away to the Wilson murder. So this is two years after being released from prison for being a, quote, model prisoner, unquote. Hmm. So he used the same story. He said that he brought her back and they agreed to have sex. And then she refused after they had already started... Which is still refusing. And then yeah. he strangled and dismembered her. Because how dare she? Um, patriarchy. There was near surgical precision in which he dismembered them. But he said he was not a hunter. And he didn't have any formal training as a butcher. He said that when he chopped up Joan, he didn't have a car to dispose of her body. And it took more um, time. So he just decided to dismember her. Because it worked well the last time. Yeah, like a peach. You ended up in prison, and I hope you end up in prison this time, too. Yeah. And so he wouldn't say in as many words, but they clearly knew that this was a habit and part of his obsession. So he was sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole this time. Good. Criminal psychiatrist started working with Dick. Good. Came to the conclusion he was perfectly normal, socially adjusted individual, unless women turned him down. So he was just a normal guy, but if a woman turned him down, he'd just snap and kill them. So, sure, perfectly normal. Uh-huh. Um, they concluded that rejection would send him in a, to literally a murderous rage. And so he's been in there. So when he confessed to the murder of Betty, he also confessed to another murder in the same style in 74. He said he picked up a woman at a bar, convinced her to come home, choke her to death, mutilate, just remember her. They let a, he led the detectives to shallow graves where the bulk was there, but the head was never located. And they were mostly skeletal, so there's no way for the woman to be identified. Aww. Dick said he, she didn't know his name and never heard anything more about it. He figured that nobody missed her. And her <gasps> re- identity still remains unknown. Oh, poor woman. So he, like, casually threw it in there. And he's like, oh, I don't know her name. No one's looking for her, so who cares? Oh, I know. So that she's still a Jane Doe. But I'm hoping that maybe a lot of the new projects that are using DNA yeah. will hopefully be able to find out who, who's missing her. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we know of three murders. He confessed to three murders. I'm thinking that those probably are his only three victims. Uh-huh. There should have been, I hate to say one, but he should never have gotten out to commit two more murders. Right. Sorry. It should have stopped after the first. Should have stopped after the first. And even though the first is obviously horrifying, he had no business being released and murdering two more women. Right. One of them a mother of 11. Who clearly was just in survival mode. Right. Can you imagine having all of your children taken away, but you knowing that you can't provide for them and knowing that's the only solution? Can you imagine hiding in a trunk? 
Yeah. Trying to escape her abusive husband that she married at 16 to be picked up and murdered immediately when she started her new life. Oh, yeah. That's just unfair. Horrifying. That's so sad. But, yeah, so I think there's probably only three victims to him, but I have zero doubt that if he had ever been released again, he would have just kept killing people. Oh, yeah. And released again shouldn't even be something we have to say because he chopped a woman up into pieces because she didn't want to have sex with him and he should have been in jail the whole time. Oh, yeah. So that's the case of Dick Marquette. What a dick. Yeah, he really is a dick. We hate him. Um, But I hope that one day, hopefully, our Jane Doe will um, get a name and she'll be able to have a name put with her. So So sad. Yeah, that's my case. Well, we hope you enjoyed your tour of Portland. Bye. Bye. Follow us on Instagram at Dark Side Tour Guides and on Twitter at Dark Side Guides. Give us a like on Facebook at Dark Side Tour Guides. Visit the blog at darksidetourguide.wordpress.com or email us at darksidetourguides at gmail.com.